than 300 ayatollahs. I think that the most important achievement of Iranian revolution was the change of the direction of the human being throughout the world. And it made the people throughout the world to understand that the religion is still living and it is still able to solve many, many things for these human beings. The shrine of the eighth Imam of the Shias, Imam Reza, is here in the holy city of Mashhad. Like most Iranians, Ayatollah Yusuf Sanei, one of the most revered and influential religious authorities in Iran, often comes here whenever he's not teaching in Qom. Ayatollah Khomeini treated Ayatollah Sanei as a son. Prior to the revolution, he was a Khomeini protege. But Sanayi's sweeping endorsement of Khomeini is not backed by history. Critics remind us that Iran's ayatollahs soon after coming to power funded Hezbollah and other terrorist groups to export its revolution. The movement has gone on to blackmail hostile states with their brand of terrorism. After the revolution, Imam Khomeini had referred to the US as the Great Satan. On the 4th of November 1979, a group of students loyal to the Iranian government invaded what they claimed was a den of spies, the US Embassy in Tehran, and took the staff hostage. They were released 444 days later. This hostage taking is today justified by Khomeini's protege. At that time, this embassy was working against the revolution, this young revolution at the beginning of its um, days they were trying to destroy this revolution, they were trying to overwhelm this revolution. But, and therefore the group of young university students, they attacked the embassy and then happened what happened. And I think the media, the Western media, misused this incident and they tried to show a very violent image about Iran by this incident. But experts have argued that this hostage taking was part of an effort by Khomeini to foster Islamic populism and defeat a secular middle class in Iran, which had managed to survive the revolution. In April 1980, the American president, Jimmy Carter, severed all diplomatic relations with Iran. More than 20 years later, the embassy stands testimony to U.S.-Iran relations. By the end of 1979, the Soviets took control of neighboring Afghanistan. The decade-long fight by the Mujahideens against this occupation is seen by Muslims as one of the great examples of modern-day jihad. Haji Abdul Rasul Sayaf is one of the veterans of that campaign. Years later, he also resisted the advancing forces of Taliban in his province of Pagman, a two-hour drive from Kabul. For Sayaf, the war against the Soviet Red Army and the war against the Taliban were both a jihad. To attack on innocent people, to do aggression on others, innocent nations and people, this is not jihad, this is war. In retrospect, it is also said, with some justification, that the concept of jihad did not unite the Afghan resistance, which remained divided by social, political, ethnic, and ideological differences. Although the resistance groups all considered themselves mujahideen, they did not cooperate effectively, 
and often fought each other rather than the Soviets. And after the Soviet withdrawal, they continued to fight each other. But the Afghan cause did attract considerable support from the rest of the Islamic world. Apart from the Afghan Mujahideen, there were thousands of young Muslims from across the world who journeyed to Afghanistan to participate in this holy war. Some from as far away as Indonesia. Habib Abdurrahman bin Ismail does not look like a typical jihadi as he sits in the veranda of his house in Parum, about a hundred kilometers away from Jakarta. Habib was born into a relatively affluent family and grew up to enjoy Western music and European cars. I'm not rich like Osama bin Laden, but good enough. I have Mercedes Benz, I have a good life. Many kind of music I like, Rolling Stones, The Beatles, and I still remember that song. I like Elvis Presley, I like John Travolta. But Habib's Travolta days were numbered. His formative student years coincided with international events that began to have an effect on the young man. In 1979, I was studying in, in university. And I don't care about that, what the heck. But I'm proud about Khomeini. I saw a brave man. He against America but by himself, oh, good man. In my room, I have a big poster of him when I was a teenager, when I was said, good man. It is here in the Al-Azhar Mosque in South Jakarta that Habib's journey begins. He was confronted by a man seeking recruits for the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. This chance encounter in the mosque played on young Habib's mind. To ease his dilemma, Habib's grandfather appeared in his dream and offered him his blessings to join the jihad in Afghanistan. Habib decided to park his Mercedes and walk the path of a born-again Muslim. He left for Afghanistan. For Habib and many hundreds of Southeast Asians, Afghanistan turned out to be the ultimate culture shock with an alien landscape of forbidding mountains. Yet, young Habib found such hardships inspirational. Jihad is fight for Allah. In Afghanistan, for example, when the Soviet attack Afghanistan, they attack the Muslim society, Muslim people. So we must jihad for protect our right, just jihad. Jihad is not attack, jihad is defend. I'm not to fight for Afghanistan, I fight for Islam. And today, he outlines the motivation which he claims eventually propelled the Mujahideens to victory. We are fight for Allah. The Soviet Union fight for money, for salary. They're afraid. Maybe they have a, you know, a, 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 a modern gun. We, just, you know, with local guns, with the, you know, old-fashioned gun, but we have a brave, we have a belief. They have not. They fight for medal. They fight for money. We got the medal from Allah in the paradise. Empowered by the Mujahideen victory over the once mighty Soviets, Habib, like many other jihadis, returned home. Although the war in Afghanistan was solely against the Soviet occupation, it created a longer-term mentality of jihad, which some found hard to abandon. Habib went on to form a paramilitary group called Lashka Jundullah, or the Army of Allah, which sent thousands of jihadis to Maluku Island in a religious conflict between Muslims and Christians that would kill more than 5,000 people. But after the Bali bombing crackdown by the Indonesian police, Habib's Lashkar was disbanded. Now only a few remain to serve as his personal bodyguards. I'm so angry with the men, in, with the men who said they bombed Bali because they are not Islams. They are not Islams. One again, that's not Islam. Because Islam not kill innocent people. That's the point. You must learn about Islam's more than that what you know. Islam's is peace religions. We can go jihad because they attack us. 
but we have no any idea to affect nobody, especially innocent people. The two main accused in the Bali bombing, Muklas and Samudra, were also shaped by their experience as jihadis in Afghanistan. Because of his knowledge of Arabic, Muklas was introduced to bin Laden in Afghanistan in the late 1980s. But these jihadis returned to an Indonesia where President Suharto had successfully marginalized Islamic fundamentalists. Abu Bakr Basir was one of the clerics who fled Indonesia to live in Malaysia. He had left this Islamic boarding school in Ruki, near the central Java town of Solo, where he had taught for several years. In 1998, the Suharto regime fell after the collapse of the Indonesian economy. The coming years saw a resurgence in Islamic militancy, brought about in part by the return from exile of radicals like Abu Bakr Basir. He came back to teach at Ruki. Thousands of young boys have studied here, and amongst those that Abu Bakr has taught and inspired in this boarding school are Muklas and Samudra. They confessed that Basir, or Ustad as he is called by the students, is the alleged spiritual leader of Jama Islamia, the network believed to be behind the Bali bombings. Abu Bakr Basir was arrested seven days after the Bali bomb. Basir's arrest also brought into focus a community of five million Indonesians of Arab Yemeni descent known as the Hadramis. Like Habib, Abu Bakr Basir and many of the other prominent Islamic militants in Indonesia also belong to this conservative community of Arab Indonesia. The Hadramis are being noticed because of their growing Islamic conservatism, as well as for their exposure to militancy in Yemen. Hundreds of young Hadramis are sent to religious schools in Yemen, which is also the ancestral home of Osama bin Laden. Back in Ruki, these boys realize that the world's attention is focused on them and the fact that their school was suspected to be a jihad factory. Osama is still a hero here. I like Osama bin Laden. Despite the evidence which links Abu Bakr to the Bali bombing and other acts of terrorism, these boys are vocal in their defense of their spiritual leader. Hati saya, kalau bukan hati saya, semuanya orang itu ditangkap itu ya marah lah. Selain yang masuk orang nggak bersalah, masuk ditangkap kan, saya kalau dia masuk akalan nggak nggak pas itu loh. Masuk orang ingin men menegakkan satu kok serah ditangkap. Sedangkan yang korupsi-korupsi lain itu nggak ditangkap. Itu kan kami minta keadilan dari sana gitu loh. While Agu and his friends play basketball in the school quadrangle, they're aware that they are looked upon as potential Islamic terrorists. Today, these traditional centers of Islamic learning, or madrasas, are under massive scrutiny. Experts believe it is here that a conservative and purest brand of Islam is being propagated. Nowhere is this more evident than thousands of miles away in Pakistan, where in these madrasas, the fundamentalist interpretation of the religion infiltrated and helped breed the jihadi mentality. These uh, madrasas, religious schools, have uh, fostered the growth of a Wahhabist notion of Islam. And uh, the Wahhabist notion of Islam has got certain uh, outstanding attributes. Among them, uh, a very simplistic dichotomization of the world, Muslims and infidels. Uh, certain notion about puristic, puritanical Islam, which is very, very dangerous, because what they're trying to say is that everyone else except their own group is somehow uh, beyond the pale. And this, I think, is a very dangerous notion of Islam. By 1979, Pakistan had become a base camp for the forces opposing the Soviet troops in Afghanistan. It was then 
that Osama bin Laden first came to this region to fight the Soviet invaders. Many years later, on the 27th of August, 1998, in an interview with the French news agency, AFP, bin Laden confessed, I set up my first camp in Pakistan where the volunteers were trained by American officers. The weapons were supplied by the Americans, the money by the Saudis. Money poured in from Sunni Arab countries eager to counter the radical Shia Islam sponsored by Iran's revolutionary regime. In the process, Pakistan became the battlefield in an intra-Islam proxy war. According to official statistics, around 2,000 new madrasas were set up during the Afghan war. If you look at both Pakistan and Indonesia, it seems to me that poverty has something to do with this. When um, Muslims are not able to provide for the education of their children, they go to schools of this sort where education is free, everything is taken care of, and um, they become captive to this type of education, which I think uh, really poisons the Muslim mind. Experts also argue that the archaic and non-secular curriculum in these madrasas help create bigoted minds, helping in the process to alter the religious landscape of the Muslim world. Uneducated, ignorant mind can fall a victim to the sort of propaganda which the madrasas started. And what madrasas did was they said that, look, your children are not able to get their admission in the public schools or government schools and others, send them to us. And when they went there, they polluted their minds. Now, these are all based on what you call a Nazi type of an organizational build up. I don't say that they have become Nazis right now, but if unchecked and left like that, they can become the, what you call, the breeding ground of fascists. For these moderates, the solution lies in unshackling the Muslim community and making them embrace a more secular education. Madrasas must close down. And when I say that must close down, I'm referring to the type of education which is used there. And I don't mind a person knowing his religion, his culture, but then he should at the same time be taught and given a good education about the country to which he belongs, about the common problems and the realities of that particular country, about the future vision which you have got for that country. A large number of these madrasas identified themselves as part of a Sunni school of thought named after Deoband, a small town in North India, where the original madrasa was founded in 1867. Darul Uloom is a product of what is referred to by Indians as the First War of Independence, the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857. Britain's victory ended the Muslim dominance of the subcontinent, and the Diobandis, as they are called, sought to create a new generation of learned and self-confident Muslims. The Diobandis take a restrictive view of a woman's role in the society oppose all kinds of hierarchy and reject Shia theology. Abdul Wajid is one of the 3,000 plus boys who come to the school, mostly from poor families, and are provided their basic necessities. They live modestly and are expected to adhere to a serious schedule of discipline. But what this school is probably most well known for is that it is also the spiritual home of the particular brand of Islam practiced by the Taliban. Wajid is not very comfortable with the association. We have in India and in other countries. For example, the Muslim Parishad, etc. There are people who want to know how to make our Islamic Islam, how to make our Islamic Islam, how to make our Islamic Islam. There is no such thing that you have seen here. There is only a purpose of living in our life and the purpose of living in our life. इसके अलावा कुछ भी नहीं वो सब साजिश से हैं और उसे बदनाम करके पेश किया जाता है अब उसके लोग गलत असर ले लेते हैं और कुछ नहीं While the intellectual underpinnings may be similar, the Taliban were to take these beliefs to an extreme, which the original Diobandis would never have recognized. Theirs was an extreme form of Diobandism, which was being preached by Pakistani Islamic parties in Afghan refugee camps in Pakistan. 
تو یہی نوجوان تھے جو پاکستان میں آئے کوئی تیس لاکھ سے زیادہ افغانی پاکستان میں آئے ان کے بچے یہاں پڑھے ہمارے دینی مدرسوں میں پڑھے جوان ہوئے یہیں پر آنکھیں یہیں کھولی انہوں نے پھر واپس گئے دیکھا کہ یہ ہاتھ جس کے لیے ہم نے لڑا تھا وہ اسلام تو نہیں ہیں ہمارے لیڈر تو آپس میں لڑ رہے ہیں رہے سے افغانستان کو بھی تباہ و برباد کر دیا تو ان نوجوانوں کے بیچ میں ایک رد عمل پیدا ہوا اور انہوں نے کہا کہ جی نظام کو اپنے ہاتھ میں لینا ہوگا In their quest to build what they thought would be the world's purest Islamic state, the Taliban imposed rigorous Sharia laws and unleashed a reign of terror. In the summer of 1996, the Taliban found a new benefactor, Osama bin Laden. In exchange for a haven in Afghanistan, bin Laden offered the Taliban money and fighters. خلق یا فزور بی ول طالبان و فزور بی ول القاعده و تخلق ور جلد نو د القاعده و سره چا شر نه راتلله خلق یا فزور په وطن کې ټوله ول بی ول جنگو ته جنگونه په کول د القاعده او په بغل کې درول طالبان خلق په خپل رضانه دی سو کوتره کوي ریچر بای با 3 ملین ډالرز مولا عمر ایمرجډ ان کندهار اند ډسپلیډ دی ریسپکټبل کلوک اف دی پروفیټ محمد Soon, Osama began to unfold his terrorist agenda. On the 7th of August, 1998, the Al-Qaeda bombed the American embassies in East Africa, killing 224 people. A year later, Al-Qaeda rammed the USS Cole at Aden with a boat laden with explosives. Bin Laden later described this attack, saying that pieces of bodies of infidels were flying like dust particles. The Al-Qaeda had found a safe haven in Afghanistan and had launched their global jihad. By early 2001, the Taliban were playing host to thousands of foreign self-slide jihadis who were later captured and kept in Afghan prisons. The Taliban had a profound belief in never-ending jihad against non-believers. A jihad which after 9-11, they declared against the United States of America. It is this belief that drew Abid Rahman from Yemen to the Taliban. I don't know how much the Taliban has been in America. But if you think about it, it's not a risk. 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 دوباره ملته لرای و ته روز شکست اوگه اب انشاءالله نوبت امریکا طالبان و بلادن و القاعده نه تنها از نظر تروریستی و اتهام ترور به اسلام زرر زدن از نظر این که گفتن اسلام طرفدار حقوق انسان ها نیست اسلام تبعیز دارد بیشترین زرر را هم باز به اسلام وارد Television was banned by the Taliban, and no news came out of Afghanistan. But there was one Arabic news channel that managed to stay on. When Taliban decided to blow up the 1,500-year-old Bamiyan Buddha statues, Al Jazeera was there. But the first time most Americans heard the name was Sunday, the 7th of October, 2001, the day American forces began bombing the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, 27 days after the Twin Towers came down in New York. Al Jazeera is seen by many as the only Arabic platform to put truth and objectivity above its own survival. But it has also been attacked not only by the Americans, but also by virtually every government in the Middle East. Al Jazeera is significant because it offers a forum for debate within the Arab-speaking Islamic world on all contentious issues. In fact, all over the Islamic world, 
Decisive debates are being waged between moderates and hardliners over who among them will define the future face of Islam. One such debate is being waged in Britain, especially in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Can you imagine yourself flying in an aeroplane and then suddenly somebody coming to you said, sorry chum, you're not going to the, to the destination you're aiming to go to, uh, you're now part of a bomb. I mean, that, that's something that uh, no one can, can, can condone at all. When I made my statement of condemnation, about what happened in, the, uh, in, in America uh, on the 9-11. Um, they, they, the mosques in this country, which are well over a thousand mosques, all of them, all of them joined with me, except two, two mosques. To fully practice Al-Islam, these people cannot form the temptation. One of those two mosques was the Finsbury Park Mosque in London, where the Egyptian-born Muslim cleric Abu Hamza preaches. This mosque has been reported to be notorious for the radicalism of its message and the number of suspected terrorists who worshipped here. Hamza himself is missing a hand and an eye. Injuries, he says, he sustained while tackling a landmine in Afghanistan. After the attacks on 9-11, Hamza had said that if the plane hijackers had carried out the attacks in the name of Islam, then their martyrdom is the highest form of jihad the vocabulary that uh, people like Osama bin Laden use or you know his counterparts is completely counterproductive. I don't think that the grievances of the Muslim countries can be redressed through violence. I, I believe that you have to wage uh, democratic struggles. You have to wage uh, secular struggles. Self-appointed defenders of the faith, like Abu Hamza and Osama bin Laden, appropriate jihad to justify their agenda of violence. On the other hand, Islamic scholars like Maulavi Allahad in Ghazni, Afghanistan, quote from the Quran to put the concept of jihad in its proper perspective. <laughs> Experts argue that another factor radicalizing segments of the Muslim world is the growing perception of their being marginalized by what they see as American double standards in international politics. I think this anger is also related to what they see as uh, America's double standards. Again, related to the Palestinian issue, but it's part of something much bigger. The perception is that uh, somehow when it comes to Muslims, they don't apply the same standard. To the Muslim world, the issue of Palestine remains an emotional one. Here, jihad is led by Hamas, established in Gaza in the late 1980s. Its name is an acronym for Islamic resistance movement. But it also means zeal in Arabic. Hamas came into prominence during the first Intifada, which began in 1987, presenting itself as a rival to the secular PLO. Its aim is to replace Israel with an Islamic Palestinian state and it enjoys significant popular support among Palestinians. It came into prominence with attacks against Israel, including suicide bombings, all in the name of Islam. But does the Quran justify these suicide attacks? <laughs> کابور اولی دی خصوصا زمور پیغمبر حضرت محمد مصطفی صلی الله علیه و سلم فرمایلی دی و یک چیزی یو انسان پا خودکشی که مرسی او پا خپل خپل زان مرتی تر وجه در آخرات پری حتی پا قیامت که بده ده عذاب هم داغوی چی تا آغا شکل بمولکی دی او بیر تا بساور کول کی دی تا آغا شکل بمولکی دی بیر تا بساور کول کی دی یعنی ده بده ده سزا او جزا دی تو این اسلام دیس اس پراه بیدد 
even if a conventional weapon is used against the civilians, that is absolutely wrong. So I say suicide bombing is just one element in the larger question of use of force. So I'm very clear and there is no controversy about it. Analysts claim that militant Islam cannot be curbed till there is an attempt to inject democracy in the authoritarian and dictatorial regimes of many Muslim countries. The reason why the fringe elements, the fundamentalist elements within each society are not dealt with is simply because of the existence of undemocratic, authoritarian, feudal governments in most Muslim societies. I think the real problem today facing the Muslim countries, a problem that the Muslim intelligentsia must address, is not, not militancy, not Islamicism, but the absence of democracy. The Muslim world is today in turmoil. The fringe radical movement has in recent times occupied far greater media and mind space than it deserves. Thus alienated, these moderates feel they are unable to mount a robust challenge posed by the fundamentalists. I think the moderates do voice their views. One thing which really is the fault of the media, here is not our fault, the people who really want to speak sense, is not moderate, I would say mainstream, I'd rather call it mainstream. The mainstream is not given the scope in the media uh, that, it, that, that it deserves. Why? Because the extremists make a better copy. And that is the whole problem. The, the extremists may make a better copy. Uh, if you come and say, well, uh, I'm going to blow up something or I'm going to do this, then you get immediately attention. There are over 1.3 billion Muslims all over the world. A decisive battle within Muslim civilization is already underway between the moderates and the ultra-conservatives. This battle is for the very soul of Islam. For moderate and